Hi guys! Hi everyone! Oh, hi Ines and Valen! <laughs> Super cool that you guys are all here. Um, I know, hey guys, hello. nice to meet you. Yeah, hello, hello guys. Long time we'll see. Looks like we have a bit of a full house today. That's super duper awesome. And I think while we're also still waiting for more people, um, I want to thank everyone for, for being or for joining our Butter Mixer. It's our ninth edition now, so super awesome for everyone um, in joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, Brittany, for sharing your time. Uh, I think today what we're definitely going to be discussing around uh, facilitating remote work workshops with confidence, and it's sure to be a fun topic. Uh, but before we start, given that everyone seems to be quite new, I'd love to know first uh, whether it is your first time joining the Mixer. And if yes, then welcome. If it's uh, if you've uh, been a regular at this point, then thank you so much for continuing to support this pet project of ours. Cool. Okay. This is when music would be really, really good while um, <laughs> waiting for people. Okay. Seems like it's mostly a, a, a new crew. Thank you guys. How? It would be cool, like after the session, if you could also let us know how you heard about a butter mixer, so we we can also continue to sort of build that connection with you guys. And obviously, if you also want to know more about, or want to discuss certain topics, we'd also love to hear your suggestions. And let me end this one now. While we're waiting for people, we'd also love to know where you guys are coming from, who you are, and maybe just a fun fact. So if you don't mind just humoring us a bit and letting us know, um, telling us a bit about yourself, that would be more than amazing. And let me put on a timer while we're waiting. That's cool. I, I, it's super awesome that everyone's coming from different parts of the world. I really love all the... What's the funniest that you, you, you're you seeing here, Brittany, in terms of the fun facts? Um, I would say funniest is that Rob can't think of one fun fact about himself. <laughs> Rob, come on! <laughs> Unbelievable. I, how, no, I'm not, I'm not going to... I'll just leave it. <laughs> That's always good when we don't know ourselves enough to know the fun facts. And I think that's yeah. essentially um, our welcome to our butter mixer um, icebreaker. Thank you so much, guys, for humoring us. And I think just um, so we can move on to where why you're actually here, right? We're here to essentially listen to Brittany and uh, her tips on how to facilitate remote <laughs> workshops with confidence. I, I think I, I, I don't need to introduce her as much at this point. She seems to be an influencer in her own right when it comes to B2B content strategy and essentially helping brands when it comes to doing the, 
Love tea, excellent. Um, no need for introduction. I think, uh, Brittany, do take it away uh, in that regard. Okay, thank you so much, Cheska, and thanks everybody for showing up. It, this is like uh, really cool for me, especially because um, I can see your faces. Because usually, when you know, when you have this many people in a room, it's um, you're usually just speaking to like a dark hole. So uh, I'm really <laughs> happy to actually be able to see some smiling faces. So welcome. Um, I will introduce myself because I think probably there, um, you know, uh, some people are like, who the heck is this lady? Um, I am Brittany. I am from Canada and I currently live in Berlin. Um, and like Cheska said, I do a lot of kind of brand building, a lot of content strategy. Um, but several, well, I was going to say several years. It just feels like several years, to be honest. About a year and a half ago, let's say, when I, I actually went on my own to do consulting, um, that's kind of in and around when this glorious pandemic hit us. Um, and basically, I was doing what everybody else was doing, kind of um, scrounging around trying to figure out how I was going to actually still work and uh, work with companies who were not actually in Berlin with me. So this was um, a real struggle and something that um, I learned a ton about. And was, I was doing that thing with, I think a lot of you might have been in the same boat where you started just being like, yeah, no, we can totally do this remotely. It's no problem at all. That three day workshop for sure. It's all going to happen remote. It's not going to be an issue. Um, and then just figuring out how to do it. So that was basically what I did over the past year and a half. And I love to share what I know. So I'm super excited to also hear about your experiences, but I'll just be sharing some things that I've found worked for me. Um, and I've prepared a cool little presentation. Maybe I'll go ahead and share that now. Hold on. Cheska and I, we, we, uh, troubleshooted this so it should be totally fine <laughs> how are we doing all good not too bad mm -hmm. okay cool here it is okay there's my cool presentation and uh yeah so i already introduced myself um you can follow me on the the social things if you if you don't already and also feel free to like message me on linkedin and let's have a chat always up for for that so feel free um, if any kind of, we're going to do Q&A at the end of this, but if anything comes up where you're like, let's talk more about that, I'm so up for a chat. I'm also alone most of the day, so would love to talk to some people. Anyway, um, moving right along. I, I think we already kind of covered this, who everybody is, but I thought I would um, maybe just ask, maybe we've already done the who, where you're from, so no need to answer that. But I'd love to know what your facilitation experience is. So are you pretty advanced? Are you relatively new? Are you somewhere in between? Intermediate, maybe, is a good spot to be. Are you doing this really regularly and you're just looking for maybe some fun ideas and inspiration? I'd love to hear about that. Let me see here. Can I see? You can answer in the chat, right? Is that that'll happen, right? So just new to I don't know. If, there we go. Pandemic intermediate. Love that. Yeah, just drop your your uh, answer in the chat. I'm going to be asking questions throughout this uh, presentation to help us kind of work together a little bit on this new to facilitation. Cool. Rob classic. Rob only does this every day of his life. Um, cool advanced intermediate beginner great this is going to be good for you guys across the board basically i think for beginners i think it will be um super duper helpful and i think for you very experienced people maybe it'll it'll um give you some like fresh new ideas or things that you can maybe take and use in your own practices at least i hope so um but last thing that i'd like to know before i get into this i think this will help also me understand like you know um what I should talk more about, what I should sort of leave aside. But what do you do? do are you um, a design, a product designer, potentially? Are you an innovation coach? Are you just like a facilitation workshopper extraordinaire? Tell me what you do. UX designer, yes, I can expect that. Jack of all trades, innovation coach, I was right, yeah. Cool, product designer, design brand engineer. Oh, cool, very, very cool. Okay, we've got people coming from all sides, a lot in the sort of like innovation space uh, and product space, which is um, understandable. So that's awesome. Okay, this is really good to hear. I'm happy that uh, you're all here and I think we can all kind of learn from each other as well. So let's get into the agenda. So this is good, the agenda. I mean, we don't have that long together. And to be honest, 
I'm going to do one of those classic facilitator faux pas and try to cram a ton of stuff into a small amount of time. Don't do it. You heard it here first. But I am going to try to give you, I just really wanted this to be valuable. So I'm going to really throw a lot at you. So feel free to frantically, you know, uh, write notes. I think Chefka said she's recording this, so I'm sure that it will be available somewhere after the fact. Um, but this is what we're going to talk about. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about the emotional side of facilitation. Isn't that adorable, right? Well, but I think this is super important because I think that um, often we don't think about these things on a deeper level, right? We're often thinking kind of flying by the seat of our pants. How can we get people to do this and that? But let's think about more the emotions that they might be feeling. Then I'm going to share with you my five steps to a successful kickoff. Um, this is, you know, I, I'd be really curious to see if we're aligned, you experienced facilitators, on these sort of five steps. Um, we could talk about this after maybe. But I have these five things that I always do. So I'm going to share with you those things and sort of how I do them and why. Um, and then I have a little, uh, a, a nice sort of tidbit where we're going to talk about difficult participants difficult people, troublemakers. Everyone um, always has different reactions to when you call people troublemakers or difficult because usually they're not trying to be difficult, right? So that's a good thing to remember. But we're going to talk about that a little bit because in terms of feeling confident as a facilitator, I think these are the biggest things actually. It's the kickoff of your workshop that's super important. And then the other thing is along the way when you're kind of hitting these roadblocks, let's be honest, it's usually because of people who are in your workshop. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then we'll have some time for some Q&A. And uh, maybe we can even get a couple of people, a couple of the expert people to hop on and answer some of the questions too, when I'm stumped for an answer, right? OK, wonderful. So let's dive in. How about that for an animation? I hope you liked that as much as I did. OK, setting yourself up for success. So this is kind of uh, the ultimate um, when it comes to facilitation, right? It, what is it like? Uh, if you're not planning, then you're failing. You guys know actually what I'm talking about, right? You don't pl if you don't plan to prepare, you prepare to fail. If you don't, you know what I mean. I feel like we all know what I'm talking about, and I'm not even going to try to tell you what the right saying is. So it's really super important to set yourself up for a good workshop, no matter if it's literally an hour or two, or if it's a full week. It's really all about the setup, the preparation before, and the kind of the beginning, right? That's when it all sort of happens. Not to put too much pressure on you, but at the beginning of the workshop, I find this is kind of the critical moment. Um, so my question for you right off the bat is, in a workshop environment, if we think about this, whether you're remote or in person, how do you want your participants to feel? So this is like I was talking about that kind of emotional state. So we are always thinking about what we want participants to do. But I think it's really important to actually take a step back and think, OK, but what, how do I want them to feel, right? Because that will really impact um, you know, how they're participating. So how do you want people to feel connected? Yes, excited, absolutely, energized, for sure, safe. Definitely at ease, yeah, comfortable, engaged, for sure. Empowered, that's a really good one. So yeah, I'm with Jennifer, all of the above. So this is exactly the point, right? Once you think about the way your participants need to feel, you can then adjust sort of how you're dealing with them and as well the activities and the steps that you're taking to kind of walk them through your workshop. So my four, my top four, um, feelings or emotions that I want my participants to feel are safe. So we got that one. Definitely want people to feel safe. I want them to feel at ease. I want them to feel like they can speak their mind, tell me their opinion, their ideas. They're not feeling intimidated, right? Super, super important. Secondly, I want them to feel motivated. I want them to be excited about what we're doing here together today. I want them to be like really like rah, rah. Like basically, I want them to be rooting for the success of my workshop. Thirdly, I want them to be engaged, obviously. I want them to be paying attention. I want them to be contributing. I want them to actually be like submitting things. When I ask a question, I want everybody to be jumping up or 
maybe not jumping up, but you know, I want people to react. That's the, 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 you know, the dream for a facilitator is that people are engaged in what you're doing. And then the last thing is I want them to feel confident. And actually it's confident all across the board. I want them to feel confident in me as a facilitator and as a guide. And I also want them to feel confident in themselves. So much so, so kind of ties into safety, right? They feel confident that they can go ahead and contribute without being worried about, you know, being mocked or feeling silly or like they're not doing anything right. Um, so those are, for me, my four main feelings. And I think that, you know, as a facilitator, we should all sort of think about that and decide for ourselves how we want participants to feel. Um, and then we can adjust accordingly. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to walk you through my five steps to kicking off a workshop. And this will all kind of make sense now that you know how I want how I want participants to feel. So the first thing that I always do in a workshop or a meeting is introductions. And I know that this sounds obvious and I know that you all probably do it. But what's most important to remember about this is the introduction is not about who's who, you know, what person is at what rank, uh, what you do at the company, those are all important. That's important information in terms of understanding who's playing which role. But what's more important actually is that we just feel connected. Because in a remote environment, this is exactly what's lacking, right? We don't have that situation where we're walking into the room, and we're like, hey, how's it going? How was your weekend? So you have to kind of create that you have to sort of fake that situation and another thing that's kind of interesting about this is and i don't know if you know i think we all kind of fall into this trap is that feeling of um kind of forgetting that there are people on the other side of our screens so in remote work this is one thing that i mean when you think about it the internet right the internet is such a mean place because I think people often forget that there's actual people who are going to be reading or watching or consuming whatever they're saying. So just reminding your team of that, even on a small way, doing a personal introduction helps everybody feel a little bit more comfortable, right? So very, very important. I do this before anything else, intros. Really quick, nice, I ask a little question, just like Cheska did. Get everybody kind of loosened up, right? First, that's the first thing. Secondly is I set expectations. Now, when I say I set expectations, I don't mean that I just get expectations. So you know what, at the beginning of a, a long workshop, you might ask people, okay, what are you hoping that comes out of this workshop or this meeting, let's talk about it. And then people say things, right? And they put their site, well, I'm hoping we do this or I'm hoping we do that. Um, that's really important so that everyone kind of can can put forth what they're expecting, of course. But what's even more important is that you set the expectation. So you tell them whether or not we're going to do that. There's nothing that will uh, shatter your confidence faster than someone saying, well, I'm hoping that we're going to completely redesign our entire product line in this workshop. And you're sitting there thinking, we're definitely not going to do that in this workshop. You have to tell people that, right? Or else they're going to continue through the workshop thinking that you're going to redesign everything, right? So it's really important to get expectations, but even more important to set the expectations. Um, very, very important. Thirdly, an agenda. Always, always, always share an agenda. Couple of side notes about this. So when I'm sharing an agenda with participants, I I tell them what's happening. I show them the guide, right? What our goal is, where we're gonna end up, how we're gonna get there. But what I absolutely do not do is tell them any kind of time frame for anything. Not for not not for not for anything. So I'll tell them maybe when lunch is and when the breaks are gonna happen. But what I absolutely don't do is like I say, this exercise is going to take 30 minutes. This next exercise is going to take 15 minutes because you could be wrong about that, right? And most likely you will be because groups spend longer in different exercises depending on basically everything that's going on. So if, if you set these like super structured agendas with timings and everything, and then you happen to go over time, guess what? Your participants now feel like you've lost control, like you aren't actually, you know, a, uh, a credible facilitator anymore and they lose faith in you, right? So you want to give them enough information to help them relax, but not too much information where they are kind of managing you and your agenda. Um, okay. I am going to, so I see questions coming in and we will address those, but I'm going to kind of go through all of this stuff and then we can talk about those things. Um, Okay, rules. 
here's the thing. I live in Germany and we love rules over here, right? We love having the rules. Everybody abides by the rules. And I know that maybe, maybe I shouldn't say that, but um, I'm with a German. So I feel like I can make a couple of, a couple of quips, right? A couple of jokes won't, won't hurt. Um, anyway, I'm, so I am being serious. It's super important to have some rules, right, in place. And these are important for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, humans love boundaries. We might say we don't like boundaries, but we really do. We like to know what's going to be expected of us, what we are allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do. And that's, again, creating the zone of safety for everyone and a bit of trust. Secondly, when people break the rules, like let's say you have a rule where everyone has to keep their cameras on right in your workshop. If you have a smaller group workshop, this is usually one of your rules or at least should be in a remote setting. Um, and then let's say someone doesn't have their camera on. Um, usually what they'll do if they can't turn their camera on is they'll know to let you know that, right? They'll be like, hey, Brittany, uh, sorry, you know, um, I have a kid at home and they're really sick. So I, I, you know, I can't really have my camera on the whole time. I need to kind of, and then I'll say totally no problem, right? But if they just have their camera off and they, you know, they, they weren't told that that's a rule, it's much harder for you to go in and say, hey, I uh, just was wondering why your camera's not on. Because they'll be like, well, I never, I didn't know my camera had to be on, right? So setting the rules for your own workshop, whatever they might be, is super important and getting people to acknowledge them. So getting everyone to be like, okay, cool, yeah, that's the rules, I'm up for it, right? That's super important. And number four, I almost said number four, just kidding, number four. Okay, and then number five, a story. So I actually, I kind of switched this around. I told you a little bit of a story at the beginning um, about sort of my uh, my experience becoming a remote facilitator of some kind, um, which is totally fine. But storytelling in general, if you can lodge it in to your workshop somewhere near the beginning, it will be it will it will help you immensely. So what's really cool about stories, um, which maybe some of you already know this, but one of the things I find so so fascinating about it is that when you tell a story to a group of people, um, there not only does it align them, so they're all like if they're following your story, and hopefully you know you're telling kind of an interesting, engaging story. Um, if they're following you, they the group actually aligns so much so that their brain waves align. Like people's brain waves start moving at the same pace. It's actually kind of creepy, but in the best way. So using a story at the beginning of your workshop, and if you're wondering like what kind of story would I tell at the beginning of a workshop, that's an excellent question. I would advise you to think about the topic that you're covering, right? So let's say you're going into a workshop and the idea is that you are going to come out of the workshop with um, a, I mean, sorry, I don't have a better example, but like a new product idea, okay? Or a new way to do something. So you're looking kind of for a bit of innovation, some new ideas on the table. Um, what I would maybe, and you know in the room, you know in the room that there are some people who are a little bit against, um, you, you know, maybe they're against workshops or maybe they just think this whole like brainstorming thing is a bit of, you know, uh, hoopla or I don't know, a word that means like, stupid? I don't know. Anyway, they, they're just, they're not engaged. They're not interested, right? They think this is a waste of their time. Okay. So your story can then be, you know, something around, and it should be an honest story, hopefully that actually happened, but your story can be something around how, you know, um, one, like, you know, when you first, um, uh, tried going into this, you know, sort of workshop process, you had this feeling that it wasn't going to work and you could, couldn't see how you would possibly come out the other end achieving your goal. But with this really nice structure that I have for my workshop, you know, I found that it's really effective if we all work together, whatever. I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? Like tell a story that will basically bring people into your topic, get them excited and help them understand that you understand them. So you're creating a bit of this like empathy. Right. Where are my product people at? Empathy, baby. All right. <laughs> okay. Fabulous. So how does this, oh, I just clicked a little too early. So basically how does this tie back to the emotions? So obviously introductions create connection with everyone. They make them feel safe, right? Setting expectations builds credibility also makes people feel safe and confident in you as a facilitator, right? So this is super important. Sharing the agenda, everybody feels motivated. They see where we're going to end up. They see how we're going to get there and they feel confident in you as long as you don't 
tell them too many details and then not stick to your agenda. Um, providing the rules makes everybody feel safe again. And then storytelling. What storytelling does is that gives you that motivation and it engages people like nothing else. So that is my sort of five-step system to kicking off a workshop. And I would say that you can kind of move a few of these things around, but what I wouldn't change are the introductions. I always start with introductions and I always, usually, usually always end with the story, right? So then I finish with the story and then I bring people into the beginning of the workshop so that they're all motivated and engaged and excited uh, to get going. So, I mean, yeah, this is kind of a, a simple way of looking at it, but I think that if you consider how you want your participants to feel, what emotions you want them to have in your workshop, that's when you can start thinking about like, how do I structure my workshop so that they feel like that? Yeah, so, okay, okay, okay. Now we're moving on to difficult personalities, okay? So if anybody's ever had to work with Rob, um, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, Rob. How could I not? Okay. Um, okay, difficult personalities. Quick question for you in the chat. Um, what kind of difficult personalities have you encountered? So what do people do in workshops that might, you know, uh, uh, frustrate you or uh, make it more difficult for you to facilitate? <laughs> All right, Peter. Fine. I was lying, okay? <laughs> All right, Jennifer. Yeah, saying and doing nothing. Yes. Mute their, yes, yes, yes. Disengaged, yes. Not wanting to open up, apathetic, passiveness. This is so interesting because, um, so fascinating. Because when, when I used to talk to people about facilitating workshops before we did them remotely, the things you would hear all the time were like, people asking difficult questions, people trying to throw me off my game, people like arguing and not wanting. And then it's like, um, okay, so we do have, Delphine just said people talking too much. But it's funny in remote settings where the real problem actually usually is that people aren't contributing, not that they're contributing too much. But then when they do contribute too much, it's a full nightmare. Um, Okay, great. We've got the memes. The memes are going, and I like that. Okay, perfect. Difficult personalities. We have all, <laughs> the Brits, we've all encountered them. Um, so the three that I find come up time and time again are these three facilitator nightmares. The first one is, I like to call them the hijacker, right? So this person is the one who's either, they're either super excited to be there, right? And they're just like, they're talking, and they're keep like, you know, throwing everybody off and asking questions that are irrelevant and they're just kind of going crazy or they're being really openly negative and saying things like, this is never going to work. I did a workshop like this before. It didn't have, you know, nothing came out of it. I'm, you know, why are we doing this exercise? Asking really difficult questions that don't really make sense, right? This means you've been hijacked, my friends. Okay. So that's the hijacker. Number two is the ghost. So that person was brought up quite often. This is the person who, yeah, they're kind of there, but they're not really there, right? There's the, the person where you can see their face and you're like, you can tell, you can see their eyes moving and you're like, they're reading an email right now, definitely. And they're not paying attention to what I'm actually doing or saying. So this is the, the ghost is just that person who's passive, apathetic, not contributing. They're just there because they were asked to be there. Number three, is the torturer. Everybody, I mean, if you facilitated more than a few workshops, you've probably encountered this kind of person. This person talks a lot. I know I've been the torturer. I'm sure on more than one occasion, let's be honest, but often they talk slowly, right? So they talk slowly, they veer off topic. They're kind of like in their own zone, right? And they're just, they have no idea that what they're doing is really derailing your whole workshop. Um, super impossible to keep things running on time when you have the torturer. Do we have any sound effects where it's like, dun, dun, dun. Jessica, do we have that? If I said the torturer. Does that work for you? <laughs> that worked so well. Oh my God, that's amazing. Okay, thank you for that, Cheska. That really brought things up a notch. Okay, <laughs> fabulous. So those are the three nightmares. Now I'm gonna give you some tips on how to deal with each one of them because they are all a little bit different. Where are we time-wise? We're doing okay, perfect. Okay, so 
dealing with the hijacker. Now, the hijacker is the one, let's pretend that they're actually the one who is, because um, usually the case is that they're more negative and kind of taking over and asking difficult questions and bringing up things that are completely irrelevant, right? First of all, get yourself a parking lot and put it on your, wherever you're doing it, Miro or Mural or whatever digital whiteboard tool you like to use and put, establish this at the beginning of your workshop. It's called a parking lot. It's a place where you put things that uh, you wanna get to later, right? And sometimes in a workshop, you'll have someone who's bringing up questions and asking about things and saying, well, what about this? We should probably talk about this. You know, This is the perfect opportunity for you to say, you know what, this is great. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm gonna put this in the parking lot and let's come to it uh, at the end of the day or at the end of uh, the, you know, this morning or something. Cause I think it's important that we talk about that. But if we, if we talk about that now, we're gonna be running off of schedule, right? So the parking lot is a godsend for any facilitator. I know you experienced facilitators are like, heck yes, it's, it's the best. Cause it really is. Um, other thing that I love to use is the note and vote. It's so simple, right? Everybody knows the note and vote. You give everybody post-its, you get everybody to write down their idea or what they think we should do, and then everybody votes on it. You put the post-its up, you give people voting dots. It's the simplest activity, and it really quiets the room down, right? So if you're having this moment where maybe you've even got a couple of hijackers who are like, blah, 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 you know, like talking to each other, and they're like, no, we shouldn't do that, we should do this. It's like, Cool, everybody, I'm just gonna, let's just put three minutes on the clock. I'd like everybody to write down their ideas because I think it's important that we hear from everybody right now and then let's vote and let's make the decision on where to go next, right? So note and vote is also such a good tool to use, even in meetings, even if it's not a workshop, but just a meeting or a remote, remote meeting, perfect. This, the third thing that you need to remember with the hijacker is this person is most likely, um, uh, has a personality of someone who just wants to feel in control and like they're heard. Okay, so thinking about that, instead of thinking like, oh, God, this person is really being annoying and they're ruining my workshop and they're trying to be difficult, most likely they're not trying to be difficult. Um, they're just, they just are a difficult person. Just kidding. Uh, no, but they, they, they just genuinely want to be heard and they do have usually something relatively valid to say, even if it's not valid in the context of your workshop. So keep that in mind when you're dealing with the hijacker um, and always acknowledge what they're saying. So don't ever kind of like, you know, push them away and say like, we need to get on to something else. Always, at least not patronizingly, but always nicely say, thank you so much for bringing that up because I think that's a really great point. That's a sentence that I use a lot in workshops. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Okay, the last thing is round robin. So this is something if you wanna keep it vocal, you wanna keep people talking and the hijacker is going on and on about something, what you can say is, this is great. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna hear from everybody in the group and that way we can you know, all make sure that we're all, um, we've all you know, given our opinion. So let's go around, let's put a timer on the clock and let's let everybody uh, tell us what they think for one minute or whatever, right? This is perfect if you feel like you're hearing too much from the hijacker and you wanna hear from everybody else as well. So those are four things you can do depending on the situation that will really help you kind of tone down your hijacker and allow your workshop to keep flowing. Okay, next is the ghost. Do we have a ghost sound? Ooh, probably not. There's no reason for Butter to have a ghost sound, Brittany. Oh my gosh! <laughs> not too sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm not, the real, the, it, I'm, I'm not that, gonna be a hijacker. We'll let the soundboard pause for a bit. <laughs> that, I don't know if anyone saw my reaction, but I, that actually genuinely scared me. Um, that was great, you know, keeping me on my toes. That is exactly what we should have used right at the beginning. Sorry, okay, now I know for next time. Okay, dealing with the ghost. So here's what you're gonna do. The first thing that I always say when people are like, oh, this person, they don't contribute when we have um, workshops, they just sit there quietly silent, like I can't get anything from them. For me, this, this is, when you're at that point in the workshop, you've already lost your people. You've lost, you've lost this person already, right? It actually needs to start with expectation setting. So you need to actually, even before the workshop, I like to sometimes, depending on how long my workshop is, have a little onboarding session, right? Before the workshop and, and tell everybody what you're expecting of them, right? I'm expecting everybody to contribute. I'm expecting you to pay attention. Um, you know, like those kinds of things. Once you tell people that, 
there's no longer an excuse. And plus, if then you do need to ask them what's going on, why they're you know, not participating, you've already told them that you're expecting them to contribute. Um, so that's a really important one. Actually, oh, sorry, I wanna talk about one more thing here because I don't think it's coming up in one of my bullets. Um, the other thing with the ghost is that you should remember that they actually might be nervous to contribute. They might think that what they have to say isn't actually valid or important or nobody wants to hear it. So make sure that you tell your participants that they've been invited to this workshop for a reason. You want to hear what they have to say. You need their input. It makes people feel, I know it sounds silly, but it makes people feel like special, needed, um, and helps people kind of relax and be like, oh, she said that she wanted to hear, you know, from me specifically. So I'm going to, I'm going to go in and I'm going to give people my opinion, right? I just wanted to put that little tidbit in there. Other way to, to, uh, to deal with the ghost is to scare them, right? So if you randomize input from the team, as in you're not always like, oh, let's start here, or does anybody have anything to say? But if you say, hey, Cheska, um, do you have anything, you know, would you like to say, like, what do you think about this, right? Um, now, I even not, I'm not a huge fan of putting people on the spot. Um, without at least warning them that I might do that. So that's another thing that maybe at the beginning of your workshop you'll say, just so that people know and they're paying attention, you'll say, hey, I might, you know, quickly, um, you know, ask at random, um, you know, some some participants, because I, I just want to hear maybe, maybe if I haven't heard from you in a while, you know, so if that's okay, I'd like to do that. And if the, you know, and I'll, and I'll maybe even say, um, if the, if the situation is that Potentially you didn't hear what I said before or you tuned out quickly, no problem. Um, just let me know and we'll go over it. I know that it's hard to pay attention the whole time, right? So make people feel a little bit safe about it. They don't have to pretend they heard you when they didn't, but tell them that you're gonna maybe call on them randomly, like in a you know, university class or whatever. Maybe it was more of a high school thing that they did. Anyway. Other thing to do with the ghost is to pair people up and put them in breakout rooms because a ghost can't be a ghost if they're just with one other person, right? And that's super important. If you need their input and you need them to start interacting and engaging and participating, then sometimes you've got to force it a little bit, you know? So put them in the breakout rooms, give them an activity to do, um, and that should help them kind of get, get warmed up to the idea anyway. Okay. Dealing with the torturer. So I don't know why I have lips as an icon here. To be honest, I have no idea. So I'm, I apologize, but I feel like, you know, there must be something I was thinking there, but I don't remember what it was. Anyway, dealing with the torturer, right? First thing, right? The torturer, as a little reminder, is the person who is just uh, the slow talk or the moving on, like just constantly sort of interrupting and taking us on a journey uh, of their life story, right? So have your agenda visible. And this sometimes means when I'm in a remote workshop, usually I actually have the agenda behind me um, on a piece of like magic paper so that it kind of feels like I'm in a workshop space and we're in a workshop room together and people can always see it on my screen. Um, of course, have your workshop or your, your agenda visible on your digital whiteboard. Um, if you wanna have your agenda visible in butter, you can of course do that, but super important to have it visible so you can always refer back to it, right? You can say, hey, hey, uh, Peter, you know, we really actually need to keep going because look at all the stuff we have to get through before lunch, you know, so very important. Use a time timer, my friend. Use any kind of timing device. Do not ever start an exercise without timing it because the torturer will run your workshop just through the mud. I don't know. Anyway, just time things, right? Because the torturer can't go on forever if they get interrupted by a, a loud time timer, right? That's really awkward if they keep talking through that. And if they do, I mean, gosh, all the power to them. Like, I'm impressed. The parking lot, again, so this is another tool that's really good for the torturer. You might have to, as a facilitator, somewhat step in when someone is talking for a long period of time without interruption. You might have to interrupt them a little bit and just say, hey, I love this conversation that's happening here. Um, but I think that what we, you know, because of our agenda, as you can see, we, we might have to put a hold on this conversation and talk about this um, later, maybe tomorrow, maybe we, you know, we meet early and talk about it before the workshop tomorrow, whatever. You, you give them an opportunity to have that discussion. Probably they're gonna realize that that discussion actually isn't that important. Um, but if, if it is important, then you've given them, you know, you've, you've acknowledged it and you've given that chance to them to actually 
uh, have their say and, 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 you know, give their opinion about whatever it is that they were talking about. Okay. Before we go into, it's 40 minutes past, perfect. Before we go into a little Q&A, a few reminders about difficult personalities. Um, one thing that I think we need to all think about is um, not being assertive too quickly. So not jumping to the conclusion that a troublemaker is trying to make trouble and that they're, you know, you need to be really stern with them right away. That's usually absolutely the wrong approach. Usually the approach is to be very understanding, very human um, and, and gentle actually. <laughs> Be gentle, um, because if you get assertive too quickly, you, you'll turn people off, and probably you'll also turn off people who weren't even the troublemakers. So you are the facilitator, you are the guide, you are not um, there to reprimand people, right? You're just there to make sure your workshop is flowing on time. So don't jump to you know negative vibe. Use questions, okay? So this is classic for kind of all scenarios where people are asking you difficult questions, where they're, you know, saying, oh, you know, we, we should really talk about this. Ask them why, right? You know, ask them um, follow-up questions to their difficult questions. Ask them what's behind that question that they're asking. Because often what you'll teach people or what people will realize in that process is that, oh yeah, like we don't actually need to talk about this right now because we've got a meeting you know, or we had this meeting last week that talked about that and we've got a follow up. So it's all it's all cool. Right. Ask questions and and be um, as a facilitator. It's your job to be open minded and not to be you know closed off to new ideas and things. Right. So don't. Yeah, don't do that. And then the last thing is that as a facilitator, you're acting on behalf of the team. So don't forget that the team's relying on you. So even though I said, you know, don't be assertive too quickly, don't jump to like um, reprimanding people, you do have an obligation to the team to get them through the workshop and get us to our goal. So make sure you keep that in mind all the time. And even in your language, the way that you speak to people, the way that you kind of talk to people, it's to ensure that we get through it as a team and we're on track, we're on time. And, you know, we end the two or three day, whatever workshop, with uh, you know, a success on the other side. You know? So just keep that in mind because I think often we can get really overwhelmed and it's like, oh gosh, it's all on me. It's not all on you, but you are sort of the person who's speaking for the team, right? But everybody's in it together. Um, okay, that's the end of my little presentation and it's 43 minutes past. Oh! Yeah. I think that was when yeah. we, can, we can enable everyone for sound. <laughs> Totally. Is it? Uh, I'm wondering. Oh, that's that's my Wi-Fi. Okay, never mind. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So I hope that that was helpful. I know that being, um, you know, a, a confident facilitator can. It, it's just it's difficult because there's so many things to think about. Um, but I find all in all, when you step back and actually. Think, concentrate on the people, concentrate on that, you know, every, we're all human and everybody's just trying to do their best. I think that usually garners the best results um, in your workshop. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. Maybe thank I should stop, so I'll stop sharing. <laughs> I think we just stopped the sharing, but thank you so much. Oh, Those are a lot of actually good tips and super concise as well. I think um, even from, from the things that were coming in on chat, it seems like a lot of people also had um, suggestions on how to deal with the three personality types you mentioned. So super duper cool. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brittany. And I think now I let's can take questions from people, actually. Yeah. Look at all of this. Yeah. <laughs> Are you running through the chat messages now? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm taking a look at them. <laughs> of course. Guys, use if you the queue questions you can essentially you can actually use the hands up queue um so we can also yeah take your questions comments or ideas ah. does anyone have questions do i need to play cricket sounds at this point <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i love butter this is the first time i'm doing like i've been on butter before but i haven't done like a, a thing with like, lots of people involved and this is really cool it's really cool to see how it works Cool. I think we have our first question from Ava. Ava, uh, Mike's yours. Let me put. Hello. Thank you for this great session. Um, you actually mentioned it uh, on, on the go. How do you deal with people 
not being present or being the ghost. And, and what I struggle with mostly is convincing people to turn cameras on. Um, so I want some of your prompts or some of the, the ways you use on a practical level. What can I say? Because yes, I do say it would be so nice if we were all here together, but we have the cameras or I give them nice backgrounds to use and so on. But it doesn't mm -hmm. work if you have 300 people working on something. 300 people yeah. in a workshop. Yes, the last one I had it was wow. 300 people because we were the whole organization. Okay, okay, great. So it was like a like kind of like a summit uh, of people. So at this point where it's this many people and it's the whole organization, um, I think it's really unfair that it would be left on you to kind of tell everybody to have their cameras on. So for me, what I would do is I would make sure that whoever is the, you know, in charge at the highest level that this actually gets gets told, you know, from them. So it's, it shouldn't be on you as the facilitator to tell 300 people to uh, to do it. It should actually be more on, you know, the manager, the boss, whoever's in charge of this group of people. Um, it needs to come from them because it's impossible for you to, to, that would be like my best answer. But no, let's say it's not 300 people. Oh, uh, let's say it's not 300 people and it's you know just kind of a regular group size um what i do if if people aren't turning on their camp like first of all if i've already told them that it's super important that everybody turns on their camera i put it in the rules i even send an email out that states all of the things that everyone is going to be required to do for this workshop and that's listed there um then you have all right like you have all you're you're in the perfect situation to approach them um on the side, right? Not in front of everybody. I would for sure like message them directly and just say, hey, you know, um, I can see that you don't have your camera on. Um, and I was just wondering, is everything okay? Or, you know, would you be able to maybe, you know, make an appearance for this workshop? It is super important that we all participate and then we all have our cameras on. Um, that would be what I would do. I hope that's it. No, yeah. it helps a lot, especially for, for when I know the, the participants, it would be easy for me to just message them. I haven't thought of yeah. that. On, and on the other side, if there are too many, let's put it on the CIO, let's put it on somebody who has a more poor saying. Okay, thanks Definitely. a lot. Definitely. Yeah, you're welcome, Eva. My pleasure. Right up. So I am fairly familiar with you from your you know, past work with an agency that may or may not need to remain nameless, but um, <laughs> I, but um, I would feel like you're a very bubbly, almost hyperactive personality. And myself, I'm fairly calm, um, even to the point sometimes of being grim. I feel like a lot of times people get the, uh, they admire people who are different from them the most. So I would think that you may be best positioned to maybe speak to traits of facilitators that have more of a calm, uh, lower energy personality, things that I might notice as being good qualities, but you did. Totally. This is a great question. So some of the best facilitators I know are very introverted people. Um, they're very calm. They're thoughtful. Um, they don't just say the first thing that comes to their mind like I do. Um, and I would say that um, I would say the best facilitator traits are, or the best trait for a facilitator to have is to be able to listen or the best, the few, the few best, I'm going to name more than one, but I think a really good listener makes an excellent facilitator. So someone who can understand, like who's hearing what people are saying and understands what that means. Right. And the second thing that I think is really important and something that I learned, um, actually in my time of, uh, of working as a as a, a server in a restaurant, right, is was basically uh, how to kind of read the room, right, and understand what's going on, even if people aren't telling you what's going on. Um, that was that's one thing I think that it really really helps in facilitating is being able to, and that's of course why it's so difficult to facilitate remotely because you're not in the room with people. Um, but I still think that you can get a pretty good idea if you have if you're interjecting your work shops with the right sort of activities and exercises, you can get a pretty good feel for the room through that, right? So I think as a facilitator, that's all you need. I think it's so important to stay true to, I know this is going to sound 
so cheesy, but to stay to stay true to who you are, to be authentically you, because um, people know that they can under they can sense that if you're trying to like if I were trying to be super like serious and calm and talking, you know quietly or whatever it just wouldn't it wouldn't feel right to me and it wouldn't feel right to the participants um and the same with you if you came on and you were like hey everybody blah, 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 like people would be like this is really weird why is my yeah, behaving not like this <laughs> yeah exactly so don't let's not try to be someone we're not and let's just mm -hmm. you know let's be ourselves but let's be attentive and let's make it not about us but about them about the participants about the team um does that answer your question it does. Thanks for that. Cool. Perfect. I love this system. Oh. Cool. Hey. Hi, Brittany. Hi, hey. Peter. So, first of all, thank you very much. You've, you've been doing a fantastic job and uh, I've learnt, uh, learnt lots. Um, so, my question i think is around breakout groups yeah uh, mm -hmm. particularly, particularly virtual ones so um and i've been a member of many of these as well as tried to kind of run them and and sometimes so if you like some of the risks sometimes is that people easily go off topic uh sometimes they're asked to self-organize and have a spokesperson at the end yeah. so the risk is they end up talking about not quite what you asked them to do they come back uh, and they they waffle on for 10 minutes and you've only got you know a few minutes so any any top tips really for for running breakout groups so i think and i would actually really love to i mean maybe we can in the chat people can add to this because i really find that for me the best breakout sessions are short right like keep them quick um and very specific so it's like, here's what your outcome needs to be. And that's how it's going. Like to everybody, even establishing, like you said, having someone be a spokesperson, that's really great. I find it in breakout rooms, even more important is having that established before they go into breakout rooms. So it's like, because I, what I find is when you put people in breakout rooms and you say, I'd like someone to take, make sure someone's taking the time or someone's in, on track of the agenda you know, they spend three minutes trying to decide who should do that. And then, right, it's, a, it's sort of a waste of time. So just establishing that first, keeping them really short. I, and I, I would be curious how, because I know I've seen conversations about this um, on LinkedIn, especially about jumping into the breakout rooms as a facilitator. Um, so I do do that usually. And I tell people that I'm going to do that. Um, and I won't say anything like I'll, I'll tell people I'm, I'm going to jump into your breakout room, but just ignore me. I'm I'm just going to pop in. My mic's not going to be on. Don't even acknowledge me. Right. Um, and I know that that's some people would say, well, that's impossible. People will obviously change. You know, they'll see you, whatever. But I find that a really great way to just make sure that things are on track. Um, and as a facilitator, I find it impossible you know, to just send people in breakout rooms and you're sitting there by yourself hoping it's all going OK. You know, I just think and, and actually Butter just released this new feature, I think, right, where you can actually, as a facilitator, go into the room, but not actually be in the room or something like that, where you can kind of have a bird's eye view. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I think that's brilliant. Um, I, I've been I've been wanting that feature for so long uh, in workshops because I find it really uh, disruptive when you just jump in. But I do want to make sure everything's going on, uh, you know, on track. Um, and what else would I say? I think keeping the group small as well, right? Not too many people in a breakout room because as soon as you get more than, you know, I'd say more than a handful or even a handful is a lot, like more than three, and all of a sudden you have definitely two people doing the whole thing or doing all the work and no one else really contributing. Um, yeah. That's great. I would say, That's really helpful. Like, Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Peter. Hi. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually working as a service designer, so I do a lot of workshops. And one problem I have um, oftenly is that I need to introduce a new person to a well-known team, the new person in the group. And it happens, it arrives to the workshop and I need to like, this is him, her, and what to do to break like the, the group connection, uh, connect collective thinking and let the new person get in. 
So. Yeah, great question. Okay, so um, I would say that, so this isn't something that I'm doing a lot of because usually I'm going into teams that are fully established and, um, and running. But if I were thinking kind of on my feet and thinking what I would do is probably I would uh, talk to that new person before um, bringing them into the group, like before the session, just making sure that they'd be comfortable because I find that um, you know, if I gave just a sh really short introduction and said, you know, this is this person, but actually allowed them to tell us a little bit about themselves, um, that's probably a better way of doing it. I think, I, I mean, I don't know if everybody agrees with me, but I always feel kind of strange when people introduce me um, for, I mean, extended introductions because it's like, well, I can, I've got, you know, I can tell you about myself. Um, but what's even more important to consider, I think, is that everybody else do the same. So obviously this new person needs to be introduced to everybody. Um, so allowing everybody that chance. Um, I would say, now that I've been thinking about it as I'm talking, classic Brittany, is I would do, um, I would probably make it kind of simple because the first introduction, we don't need to know everything about everybody, but give um, a, a specific prompt to everybody. So maybe it's like, Okay, um, we're gonna like maybe just talk about where you came from and the, your favorite thing about your hometown or something like that. Give them a really nice, simple question. Everybody has the answer to that question. It's not there's not a lot of pressure there because I think coming into a new team, meeting everybody at once is um, a little scary. And then immediately after doing a little round robin with that, I would have a little icebreaker fun game. You know, I would play something like. Um, uh, one of my favorite games actually to do, uh, which can be a really good kind of story starter or a kind of a get to know each other game and very simple is a scavenger hunt. So maybe you, some people have done this before, but all you do is and it's so easy and in a remote setting and that's actually uh, great is you just name it. So I'd say, OK, everybody, um, I want everybody to go and find uh, a picture of themselves, like a physical picture of themselves and go like stand up, get out of, you know, and go and get it and bring it back um, and show and show us on the screen. Right. So what's cool about that is, first of all, you're getting people energized out of their seats. That's super important. And then secondly, usually people bring pictures of like cool vacations they went on or pictures of them and their kids or their pets or whatever. Um, so it, it's often a really great way to start conversations. And as a facilitator, I would then be like, hey, Ben, tell me about that picture. That looks really cool. What's happening there? Um, and now all of a sudden you have people talking and people kind of like laughing. It's like a perfect, easy icebreaker. Thank you. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yes. Thank okay. you. Cool. Thanks, Joanna. Feel like I'm at a baseball game, right? <laughs> Thank you, Cheska. <laughs> Sorry.
Thanks, everybody.